Hello and welcome to The 5 Minute Call, the podcast that takes a deep dive into the stories of the people that make theatre happen. In this episode, we're talking to Mark Hedges. Mark has experienced both sides of the audition table, performing all over the world in productions like Les Mis, Starlight Express and High Society, as well as directing and staging some of the biggest musicals, including the Bodyguard UK tour, Mary Poppins in Japan, London and Hamburg, and Phantom of the Opera for both the London production and the 150-year gala, and many, many others. Mark speaks to us about the life of a resident director and describes his work as an interface between the cast, creative and production teams, and talks about making the audition room a place for performers to shine. Hi! Hello. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for joining us on Thank the five minute call for asking me oh we're very happy you're here um we always start by asking you what's your story how did you get to be doing what you're doing in theater today i started at school doing school shows like everybody does uh then joined a amateur dramatics company which i loved um then I, from there, started, I think my parents realised quite early on that it was something that I loved. Um, and and this is, sorry, I'm interrupting already. No. It's, it's a good start, isn't it? Good. That's a record. <laughs> uh, that, <laughs> uh, that's as a performer. As a performer, right. yes. Yeah. Very much as a performer. Right. Yeah, never ever thought that I would be a director. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then, yeah, went to college to do to uh, further education college and did A levels in uh, English, English, English literature and drama. Then went to uh, dance college, drama school, and then randomly got into the industry. So you say randomly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us quite a bit more about yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I went to a college um, in Nottingham called the Midlands Academy of Dance and Drama, um, which was amazing. A brilliant little pocket college. Um, and in my second year, in the summer of second year into third year, some of us thought, oh, let's go to London for some auditions, just for some experience. You know, in the olden days, in the stage, you had those big page spread of audition for Phantom of the Opera or Grease or all of these big, massive West End shows, which was obviously the dream of all of us. Anyway, cut to that summer. Let's go to London. We're auditioning, going to open auditions for cruises. I auditioned for Grease, didn't get a recall. Um, all of these really quite big productions Anyway, went to an audition for Starlight Express um, at Pineapple. And it was, it, when you think of like those olden days auditions of queuing around the block, mm. take your picture, take your CV, it, it, was, it was that. Um, and I didn't have a picture, so I took a passport picture. Um, <laughs> didn't have a CV because I hadn't worked, because I was still at college. So made up this ridiculous CV um, and printed it off. Anyway, went to the audition and got a recall. And I was like, ooh, that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> um, so got a recall on the day, danced first, got a recall on the day, went back to sing, and then thought nothing of it. Like, nothing is going to come of this. Then two weeks later, Stephen Crockett of... Grindrod's casting team didn't have a, obviously didn't have a mobile phone then because this was in 1999 mm. okay. so didn't have a mobile phone mum and dad's um home ad home address and telephone number was on there Stephen Crockett called my parents house can I speak to Mark Hedges please <laughs> <laughs> and my dad was like yes who is this oh it's Stephen Crockett um we'd like to invite Mark to a recall for Starlight Express Again, not supposed to happen. Yeah. Went to the recall um, and then got through that recall as well, randomly, and went to skate school for a week in London at oh, wow. Alford House and got Starlight Express in between my second and third year in the summer holidays. Wow. And never went back to college. And 
made my West End debut. Wow. As a 19-year-old, just turning 20-year-old. It wasn't supposed to happen that yeah. way. <laughs> Were the college supportive? Very, very, very supportive, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, it was such a amazing but very, very odd time. And then just was suddenly in the industry and wasn't meant to be yet, mm. but was, and then stayed there for two years. Um, so, so that's where tell it us a little bit about coming down that young to London. Do you just get digs? Do you? Yes. Um, initially moved down and stayed in a friend's house. A, f- a friend of a friend was renting a house. Stayed in that house, and then that uh, that was quite short lived. Only stayed there um, for rehearsals, and then a really good pal of mine also got the show at the same time, um, a chap called Jamie Capewell, who is, don't know whether you know Jamie, he's mm-hmm. now a stage manager for Matthew Bourne. Okay. So he's been in the industry as an actor and then uh, moved over to stage management. Um, him and I moved in together and spent a lot of, well, certainly all of our time in Starlight Express moving from house to house, different houses you kind of do when you're younger in London I think yeah always yeah. moving um so yeah very young but yeah um learn the London life very quickly and obviously had brilliantly and beautifully supportive parents who uh were always down and always coming down to do my washing and (laughs) (laughs) sending food packages in the post. (laughs) I remember my mum sent me a food package to stage door once and everybody was like, oh, your (laughs) mum. She still does that now, actually. Yay. (laughs) So, yeah, so that was... Were you young in that cast or was it a very young cast in general? I was quite young, yeah. And how was that? It There were, with Starlet Express in those days, and I think with a lot of... West End shows, when I came into the industry, people were older. Mm. Casts were much older. Mm. And Starlet Express especially had quite an old company. They were all very supportive of the younger ones, myself and Jamie and a couple of others. Um, They took us under their wing. Um, And I think that's, um, that's... very evident how the industry has changed so much mm. to now. Yeah. Mm. It feels much younger yeah. these days. Yeah. Um, I feel so old now when I'm attached <laughs> to a company because everybody feels so young. Mm. Um, yeah, but they were just so supportive of us. Do you think you have learnt more from having those mentors than you would have done in those final years studying? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There was a lady in the company who was the dance captain called Sam Lane. And she was the funniest, most wonderfully supportive, brilliant human being. And I remember thinking back then, if I'm ever in a position that you're in, if I'm ever a dance captain or if ever I move on in my career, if that ever does happen, I want to be like you because she the way she commanded a rehearsal room and the way she gave notes and she could always back up what she had to say. And I've always kept her with me. Mm. She's, she was such a a wonderful human being. Um, and I always think about her now when I'm, now what I do, I always think about how she would have approached stuff and because I remember her taking rehearsals and giving notes. And also then she was in the show and I remember how she could differentiate the, the two really well mm. because she was hardcore. And of course, like on skates as well, mm. you know, she was amazing. At, she was an amazing, she, th- that skill of hers was incredible. She was a phenom- phenomenal dancer. She covered all of the girls. So she was just so inspiring. Mm. Um so now she's she's very much part of, I think, who I am as a creative. Amazing woman. That's really wonderful to be able to. Yeah. You know, when I was resident, like when I was at Phantom, mm. she was over the road at, at Only Fools and Horses. Mm. 
Mm. And we hadn't seen each other for years and years. Mm. We'd kind of chatted a bit on Facebook and social media. And she's always, you know, as we do when we say we've got a new job, she'd always congratulate me. And she, I think she went out of the industry for quite a long time. Mm. And then I saw on the cast announcement that she was going into Only Fools and Horses. And I went round to the stage door one afternoon and asked to see her and and uh, we had a couple of coffees and a couple of chats and I, it was lovely to be so back in such close contact like yeah. two theatres over the road from each other. <laughs> it's lovely. She's a wonderful lady. So how long were you there with Starlight? Two years. The last two years of the London run. Right. So I was in the final London company of the show which was an extraordinary experience being in that production anyway with that such an immersive production at the Apollo Victoria all like skating you must have seen it did you ever see it I never did I really never did, did you awful I never did no I think it I was probably I remember it being you by. There. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah it was amazing to be part of that production but then also being part of the final London mm. That old, the old school version of it yeah. was was amazing. Mm. Yes, two years. Is that quite an emotional closing? Yeah. It was a shock as well. Mm. Like when they announced that it was coming off, I think, I think I remember the cast like creating a petition and sending it to Andrew. Like, mm. please don't close the show. Oh. Like the audience love it. We love it. I mean, it's still closed, but <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, but yeah, it was it was very emotional. Such a such an iconic yeah. um, piece of theatre. Mm. Yeah, loved it so much. Fell over a lot, <laughs> <laughs> a lot. I was going to ask you about skate school. Yeah. Had you skated before? Never. As a child, had a pair of those ones, those extendable, you know, the ones mm. that you fix yeah, yeah, to yeah, your yeah, feet. The, yeah. And myself and my cousin um, falling over a lot and then getting into the into the um, skate school and then spending that week falling over a lot. Is it just a week? One week. Wow. Yeah. You do. You do. It's very concentrated on the skating, sure. but then they teach you a lot of the choreography off skates. And then at the end of that week, they just try and see how you fare. Right. But the final was on stage and you had to skate around the paddock. Did you stay up for the final? On on all of those wheels. I did actually, I think. Well done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guarantee I would not have no. done that. Absolutely guarantee. Yeah, I spent a lot of time on my bottom <laughs> in the show as well. <laughs> so what happened after Starlight? After Starlight Express, I was agentless because I'd gone to an open mm. audition. Um, I then didn't really know what to do because I'd didn't have an agent. I hadn't thought to get an agent. The show was closing and um, I then was auditioning for other things. There was an audition in the stage to for um, Thompson Holidays to go and be a vocalist. You could either, you were, you were auditioning for, for to be a singer on a cruise or a dancer on a cruise mm. or a lead vocalist. Um, and... I went to that audition again for some experience. Anyway, I got this job as a vocalist and I went to Tenerife and sang in hotels and casinos for six months and it was brilliant. Yeah. Had the I wasn't best. sure what you were going to say. Yeah. <laughs> Such a good time. Um, did that. So came out of Starlight Express in the West yeah. End, went to Tenerife and sang in hotels for six months, which was a bit of a come down, but... I just wanted to work and I wanted to perform and I wanted to sing. So I thought, why not? You know, um, I, I I didn't have, and I've never really had such huge aspirations. I just want to earn. I want to be able to pay my bills. And I, uh, I just want to do good work and enjoy working. So I did that for six months. Then I came back and I did... Panto in Lincoln at the Theatre Royal as a dancer in the ensemble with Sue Pollard. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then, so uh, when I came back from uh, Tenerife, I'd got I'd already got the panto. Before I started the panto, still no agent at this point. Went to an open audition for Chicago. Um, got a recall. Went uh, went to the dance audition. Got a recall. Went back to my recall a week or however long later, and was given material to sing um, Amos's song, um, Mr. Cellophane. Mm -hmm. Went in, did my audition, came out of the audition, walking down the stairs at Pineapple and Stephen Crockett, who phoned my parents' mm -hmm. house, yeah. um, came running after me saying, you're not working at the minute, are you? And I was like, no, I'm just, you know, resting. Um, and he said, right, are you free now? And I was like, yeah, I actually am. I'm, my train home to my parents isn't until six o'clock. He said, right, I'm going to call the National Theatre. Go there now. We're looking for a male swing for Jerry Springer, the opera. <sighs> Never heard of Jerry Springer, the opera, mm -hmm. obviously. I was like, OK. He says, I'm going to call them. They'll be expecting you. So... <laughs> didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> went to the National, went to stage door and said, oh, I'm, I'm uh, Stephen Crockett sent me. Oh, yes, yes, go upstairs to the canteen. And there were six other boys there. Um, they all had their tap shoes. I didn't have any tap shoes. I didn't have any sheet music apart from... Um, Mr. Cellophane. Mr. Cellophane. Right. Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> we went in. I wasn't dressed. They were all in their dance gear and tap shoes. I was just in my recall Chicago Amos outfit. Yep. Did the routine. Jenny Arnold was the choreographer. Did the routine um, without tap shoes on. And she they then said, right, we want to keep three of you to sing. And I was like, oh, that's me gone out the door. Mark Hedges, someone else and someone else. Don't know who the other two were. I was like... <laughs> That wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> um, went back in to sing and they were like, what are you going to sing? I said, well, actually, I've just obviously come from my Chicago audition. I have Mr. Cellophane. And they were like, do you know anything else? I was like, oh, yeah, I know Starlight Express from Starlight Express. Or I know I want to make magic from fame. But as I didn't have my rep file yeah, with yeah. me. Yeah. And they were like, okay, sing I want to make magic from fame. So sang... I want to make magic from fame. So not yeah. the right <laughs> doing everything you tell students not Never to do. Yeah. Um, and they said, okay, wait outside. The other two went in and then uh, they came out and they took me back in the room, said to the other, we just want to work with you a bit further. Um, the other two sent away and they said, you start on Monday. Wow. Your head must have been spinning. Yeah. Like, didn't live in London at that point. Was back at my parents. Wow. You start on Monday. Wow. So then was randomly... Th they'd already been rehearsing for two weeks. Um, and they needed an extra female and an extra male swing. So myself and um, another um, uh, a girl started the following Monday. And went... Like, on my first day of didn't know anything about this production mm. and rocking up on Monday and like seeing the cast list on the wall and seeing like that Alison Jaya was in it and um all of these amazing musical theatre people that I'd looked up to and watched on YouTube for so many years and was so obsessed with and went into the rehearsal and the first thing they were singing was a song that I shan't say now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but thinking what is this? What am I part of? <laughs> but my God, that was a an experience being part of that production. A good experience. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. And have and met some extraordinary people who are who I'm still very, very close to. Um yeah, but again, that wasn't supposed to happen. I've had a couple of those moments. Yeah. Um I suppose I've just been in the right place at the right time and 
with the right skills. Yes. Yeah. I think that's yeah. that's a crucial point yeah. that, that <laughs> is never picked up on. It, yeah. it, it is yeah. fundamental. I mean, going right into skills. an audition for a, a, a tap-based show, an operatic tap-based show mm -hmm. with literally um, Mr. Cellophane and no tap shoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and getting it. Yeah, that was a... And also, like, being part of that production when it won that amazing award for the ensemble, yeah. the Olivier Award, going yeah. to the Olivier, going to the Olivier's, mm. um, getting an Olivier and a physical Olivier Award, which I dropped the night of the party and broke his crown. Oh, oh no. um, bit of super glue. On but that. he's still on. He's still on the. Uh, he's still on the mantle. Did you glue piece. his crown back on? No, it was lost down a, oh, no. a drain somewhere <laughs> in Soho. Um, <laughs> classy, Mark. Classy. So classy. <laughs> so funny. Yeah. But yeah, another extraordinary experience. Amazing. Yeah. So, how do you follow that? Came out of Jerry and spent, I think, eight or nine months out of work, working at Sea Tickets and mm. doing lots of teaching. Mm. And then went into, oh, I did. Um, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe at West Yorkshire Playhouse when it was run, the Playhouse was run by Ian Brown. Uh, did that over the Christmas, which was, again, a beautiful production. Um, and then spent another, I think I spent quite a considerable time out of work. Then after that Christmas production, then did High Society that had been at Regent's Park. It was transferring into the Shaftesbury. So did that. That was nice to be part of that. Um, Jerry Hall played Mother Lord. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was yeah. Love, a, a nice experience. Again, met some beautiful friends. Mm. Thomas Aldridge, who's a really good friend of mine, um, and his wife, Helen, mm. who I ended up then doing Les Mis with. Yeah. Then so, went back to Starlight Express again, which I swore oh. I'd never do. Mm. Yeah. Um, so Chris and I, my husband, Chris, and I happened to do that together. How was that? Brilliant. We lived on a wage, saved a wage, bought a house um, and spent a year touring the UK together in Starlight Express. So that was cool. Yeah. Yeah, really nice. Yeah. We'll get back to the episode in just a minute. But I just wanted to quickly say that 75% of you are not subscribed to this channel. So if you could... Hit that subscribe button, like this video, and ding the bell for notifications so you never miss an episode in the future. So Miz is quite a pivotal one for you. Is, yeah. is Miz the one where you moved yeah, from that performing was, to? That was life-changing. I'd auditioned for Les Mis. Whilst I was in Starlight Express, my agent at the time, lovely Bronnie Buchanan, called me and said, you've got an audition for Les Mis. And I'd auditioned for the show previously three times. Got a recall once and not got a recall on two other occasions. Mm -hmm. And I was in, Ab and I remember I was in Aberdeen when the audition was meant to be. And I was like, do you know what? I'm not going to go. I, I've i auditioned. They, I'm not right for that production. Mm -hmm. And she, as she brilliantly does and did, um, you are going, um, <laughs> suck it up and sort your train out and go to the audition. So did as I was told. Um, and went to the audition. And there was just something very different, I think, about the way that I approached that audition period. Um, Les Mis had always been such a big part of my life as a child, certainly, you know, in car journeys, singing it with mm. my mum and dad. Mum and dad loved the show. Um... And I just went into that audition, I think, with a different mindset. And I got it. And I was a swing. They offered me swing cover Tenardier. And it was that being in that production it, it, it has changed my life do you know what considerably. You did, do you know what you did, did differently? It's a really hard question. It's a really hard question. Yeah. I don't know. I think I, I certainly did something with my voice. Yeah. And I don't know what that was, because I'm not I'm not skilled vocally. 
I think I'm a bit of a blagger. I think I'm also, I think I was, I can kind of manipulate my voice to, I think I'm a, I think I was an impressionist. Do you know what I mean? When yeah. I was in Starlight Express, I would do an impression of the guy on the soundtrack that played Rusty. Right. I would I I would listen to the way that they sang it and copy them. Mm. And then being in Starlight Express got that Rusty cover. I think because I copied I think he's called Greg Ellis. Yeah, Greg Ellis. I copied his voice. So then when I went into Les Mis, I and everybody does that. Oh my god, you sound so Les Mis when you sing that song. I think I just manipulated my voice. And do you think when you'd been before you hadn't thought to do that or yeah. you, your voice wasn't ready to do that maybe my voice wasn't ready I don't think as well I was a skilled enough storyteller mm-hmm. I don't think I don't think I was a brilliant auditioner um, I think a lot of getting the jobs that I got and I know that people always tell me off when I say this, but I do think it was being in the right place at the right time. And I know skill does, as you know, we've said, yeah. it does it does um, play a part. But I think when I was auditioning for Les Mis, I'd been in all of these other shows. Well, Starlight Express, Jerry Springer, mm. Those other uh, smaller productions, high society. So I'd been in the industry longer. Yeah, yeah. I think I'd matured. Yeah. I think Bronya certainly played a, played a part in. You're going for it. Suck it up and go to the audition yeah. and get it. So she was certainly part of that. But I think I I just I don't know whether I wanted it more. Mm. Mm. But I'd never. I'd never gotten a job and felt that I got it because of my skill. Until I got Les Mis. Hmm. And then my whole my my whole life changed over the course of being in that production. From being a swing with no responsibility, well, a, a, a second cover Tenardier. And being a swing anyway in Les Mis is like mind boggling. Just, yeah. <laughs> um, but then staying with the production and then... Um, Greg, who was the dance captain, he left. I took over as dance captain. Actually, it was when I took over as dance captain, then my mind changed hugely. I was, as the dance captain at Les Mis, you're very, very involved with the resident directors because it's such a big production to mount Mm -hmm. that at cast changes, you're, you know, it is you and the resident director putting it on. Mm -hmm. So that was a skill that I'd never... um, had and or, or 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 done rehearsing and auditioning the children. I'd never done that. I taught a bit, you know, but I'd never worked with professional children. And that suddenly was something that, oh, I I really like this, and I feel like I'm actually really good at this. And did you have any mentoring for anybody on it, or were you just dunked in it? I'd watched. Uh, the um, Les Mis always has fantastic resident directors, really inspiring directors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I was fortunate to watch those people mm-hmm. work in my first like year there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd watched Greg be the dance captain. So I'd watched all of that happen. And I think when you're a swing as well, certainly at Les Mis, you take on such huge responsibilities because the ensemble tracks are so busy yeah. that when there are a million people off on a Saturday, everybody is the resident director, really, <laughs> or the dance captain, because you all muck in and you'll say, oh, I'll do that or I'll move that chair. Yeah, I'll bring those cups and that chair and that table on. You know, mm-hmm. so I'd never had that experience before. So then when I became the dance captain, I suppose I just took to it really easily Mm. and had worked alongside amazing resident directors, Adrian Sarple, um, Chris Key, Mm. you know, all of these phenomenal directors um, who I learned a great deal from. I'm just thinking, can we just get a sort of brief explanation of what a resident director is and does 
and how that differs from actual director, what a dance captain is and how that fits mm -hmm. into those ecosystems. Yeah, so if you're thinking about, like, if we're talking about Les Mis, for instance, or on any or any show resident director wise, I always class myself when I'm a resident director as a theatrical caretaker. I take care of the production. I look after the production. And you're the person in the building who represents um, the directors. S Sir Richard Eyre on Mary Poppins. Hal Prince, God rest his soul, mm -hmm. on The Phantom of the Opera. James Powell and Lawrence Connor on Les Mis. So you are looking after their production. You are not directing Les Mis you are looking after somebody else's vision. Mm. And you do it, I always try and take on board their language and their thought, but using my own way of expressing the direction. So it's not, I'm not scripting what they have said. I'm scripting my own, I'm using my own way to direct their show. It's a really, it, it can be really tough because it isn't your vision. Mm. Um, but it is an absolute honour to be attached to the, these productions, you know, to mm. start with. But then also to be looking after these people, you know, the, their work. Mm. Um, so... That's the the main part of the job, I would say. Mm. But then you're very much, as the resident, you're liaising with everybody else in the building. So you're working very, very closely with the company manager, the dance captains, um, the musical director, all of those people. You are running the production. You're creating the schedule. You're um, taking understudy rehearsals. You're rehearsing children if there are children in the production you're auditioning and rehearsing children you're work if there's a children's team attached to it you're working with them you're also then looking at the production from the designer's perspective so you're making sure that the wigs don't look like wigs and that that sure. they that they are dressed properly that they fit the actors you're looking at the production from a design perspective of, of costumes, you're making sure the set is working. So you're wearing quite a lot of hats yeah. and looking after mm. a huge juggernaut of a show and leading a company of technical people, actors, musicians, children, chaperones, stage management. You're working with everybody and trying to make it cohesively run smoothly. That sounds utterly overwhelming. Yeah. How, how It can you... be yeah. really overwhelming. I think you just have to be calm. But how do you do that? I, I, I don't know. I think I'm quite <laughs> a, on the outside. <laughs> I am I'm quite a calm person. I'm able yeah. to just step away and just take a moment to think if that if that is necessary. I do get I, that impression. Mm -hmm. Like you're just the the way that you present yourself, it does feel very soothing actually. Just being here in this room just feels it's a really nice atmosphere. I, I think I pride myself on being able to connect. Mm. Um with people because that is really, really difficult because everybody is different. Mm. And I think if you can connect and you can liaise and you can inspire and you can guide people, then I think that being a resident director is not an easy job, but it's a bearable <laughs> job. Yeah. Because people are so different, you know, actors, are very different. I approach every actor differently. You can have a laugh with somebody about something that they did that was hilarious or something that they did that was not acceptable. You can still have a laugh. Whereas, whereas with other people, you have to approach it differently. You mm. have to measure your language. That is what I constantly 
I'm doing, I'm measuring how the words cascade and fall out of my mouth. Mm. So I'm constantly looking at what people need, how I can approach this problem, this this um, change. You know, that's something that I that I feel like I can do well. Do you think you knew you could do that before you started doing it? No. When I was the 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 dance captain at Les Mis, watching those resident directors and the directors deal with people was university to me. Mm. Certainly being around the production when it was the um, the 25th anniversary at the O2, you know, watching James Powell and Lawrence Connor, who are extraordinary directors, watching them direct Alfie Bow and... Um, Lea Salonga and Norm Lewis, mm. watching them direct these people into that concert version was university. Like watching them deal with that mm. and deal with all of the other things on top of that. Mm. I've just, I think I've been very fortunate to be around inspiring people. And ultimately, I just like being nice and I like being kind. You know, I, 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 I can lose it sometimes <laughs> <laughs> if it's necessary, but I, sure. but I think it's unnecessary, mm. you know, mm. but I, 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 you know, whatever the circumstance and, you know, I just deal with it, I suppose, in however I see fit in that moment. Do you have ways of dealing with your own stress then? Um, if you're able to stay calm in the moment, do you? I think I'm, qu- uh, I don't know. No. No. Or you don't I have a gr- I have a really good home life. Mm-hmm. I'm very supported with my family, my you know my husband and mm. my my mum and dad are extraordinary. My in laws are extraordinary. My close friends, uh, you know, I've got very. I'm surrounded by brilliant support. Mm. Um, so I think when I'm stressed. I've I, I've got people around me that can that can help me, yeah. mm-hmm. um, but I do deal with things as well alone. I take myself away. I'm a I'm a thinker, and I work things out, which is what I do at work as well. Mm-hmm. You know, I I try not to be spur of the moment. I always try and if I'm if I'm afforded the time. I was going to say, how do you give yourself the time? To not have to react immediately because surely there's a lot of there is a I lot need of, to know the answer yeah, is now. Yeah, yeah. Then I just take time in the moment mm-hmm. and just say, you know, let's work this out. Let's talk this through. Mm-hmm. You know, what do we need to achieve? Mm-hmm. That's one thing that I'm very, very passionate about. Actually, is collaborating and teamwork. Mm-hmm. I think I'm a better person. Because of that, I think I'm a better creative because of that. I love nothing more than working with um, the dance captains and the mm. children's directors mm. and the company manager and going, if there's a problem with somebody's costume, going to wardrobe and sitting down with the wardrobe department and talking about, right, how do we make this better? Mm. I think you have to, though. I don't, I don't think the industry could work if you if there wasn't that collaboration there because the machine doesn't work yeah, yeah. You know well I mean? when you think of Cameron Mackintosh's productions they are so collaborative mm. the creative teams are expansive mm. you know you've got numerous associate directors numerous associate musical supervisors and directors mm. there's numerous dance captains um all led by Cameron McIntosh, who likes working with teams of like-minded, collaborative, um, witty, talented people. So, you know that it's not it's not one man band central. No. Yeah, all of yeah. those productions that I've worked on for Cameron McIntosh um, are led by brilliant inspiring wonderful people you mentioned 
creativity then, how do you find creativity for yourself in this caretaking role? The language that I use, I think what I try and do is I, if we're talking about actors, I'll always try my best to make it feel like it's not a production line. Mm. The Phantom, for instance, starts there, he walks to there, then he walks to there, he has to walk around Christine, he touches her on this move. If that, that's boring, and that also makes the actor feel, it feels so prescribed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So my my job as a, as a resident director or as a creative person on those productions is to work with the actor and make it feel like it's not been done three million times before mm-hmm. by a hundred phantoms or a hundred Christines. Um, and that is tough to make it not feel like it's, you know, stand there stand on number five move to number three go round and stand on that cross Mm. because the actor needs to feel that they are part of the creating process as Mm. well Mm. i always say to actors there are markers that we have to hit there's certainly imagery things that we have to find and i think specifically when i was working on phantom All of those moments, when you walk up to the theatre at Phantom or you open the brochure at Phantom, they always capture the same images. They're iconic Mm -hmm. pictures on the front of the Mm theatre. You have Carlotta holding the severed head. Yeah, Yeah, you have the the managers looking at the letters. You have Christine and Phantom um, on the floating, falling Mm -hmm. um, Mm. positions. And I always used to call those the Hal isms. Mm-hmm. So I would always say, right, these are the Hal isms, these are the Hal Prince moments. And actors love that. Because you're mentioning the words Hal Prince. Um these were the Hal moments. So let's find that within our bodies. And then how we get there we can then put some sums in and say two plus two makes four. So let's um, make our own maths in that moment. Mm. Um, So I want you to get to there on that point, but now let's discuss these in between bits. Because for me as well, it's boring going, okay, on this word, you're going to stand up from your desk. Yeah. You know, that's, I don't, I don't want to, that's not directing a show. Yes, I'm not the director, but it's my job to direct this cast of mm. whatever the production is I'm working on. Yeah. So it's yeah, about yeah. making it interesting for me yeah. that I'm not just regurgitating the same old thing. And it's interesting, for the, more interesting for the actor because they feel that we together have invested in the blocking of, I don't know, practically perfect mm. yeah. with the Marys or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear it from the other side, actually, because obviously I'm a lot of the time working with a performer who is slotting into those roles. And we're often talking about how can we find them in the role? Yeah. How can they bring their unique talents and skills yeah. to this moment? That's it's really lovely something, hearing the other side of it. That's something that Cameron's really passionate about, mm. that you see your version of it. Um Again, it is about we 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 are playing the same character mm. that you know that that has existed forever, but it's a new version of it. We're still telling the same story. We're still singing the same words, mm. but let's not redirect it. But let's sprinkle your version onto it, yeah. and that's what keeps it interesting for me is to see another another human's version of it mm. within the parameters of the direction. Yeah. yeah, I think the way you've explained that is so wonderful, actually, that essentially keeping the essence the same and keeping those sums the same, but you can add different numbers together yeah. to get to the same it's value. It's a different it's path. Genius. Yeah. It's a different path. It's wonderful. It's the same journey. Mm. 
it's the same destination, but we we take a different, you know, a different route. We take your route. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. And that's the same right. with when you've got somebody playing a role and then you've got two other people in the building who also, at some point, will play that same role. Mm. It's the same role. Yes. But, their version of it can't be the same as the person that plays it because they are not them. They don't think the same as them. They don't move the same. They don't sing the same. So you have to find an individual's version. That's what I love doing. Would you like to direct eventually? Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I, I would like to. I've directed a couple of, you know, things... Um, small things of my own but I don't know I just really really love directing somebody else's show it's so strange I love mm. being a resident director and an associate director mm. it's a different mm. relationship with the the company presumably yeah the direct the director goes away co- goes away right mm. yeah and you stay. And I think because I never planned to be a director, as a resident, or certainly as a resident director, you're still attached. You're still in the building. You're part of the company. Um, it's a very different vibe because you're not your ma- your management. Um, and you have a responsibility to the production and certainly to the producers and the office. Mm-hmm. But you're 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 there, you're still there, and you're still part of a core um, team, and I think that's what I loved about being an actor, the camaraderie of being in the building and creating relationships, and your relationship with the stage doorkeeper, and your mm-hmm. relationship with the stage management team and the front of house staff. Mm-hmm. You know, as a resident. You still have those relationships. You still go and chat to the res- to the to the front of house team or the security guys on the front door. You still have that relationship. Yeah. Whereas, when you then go into the associate and the director world, you go away, mm. and then you just turn up at events, or at cover runs, or at, you know opening nights, mm. closing nights, birthday parties. Mm. You come back and you watch. And that's lovely for the company to, for those people to come back and reinvest in the show and, and watch and, and I think I quite like that as well when, the director comes. I obviously. Get a bit of imposter syndrome going. Oh my god, they're going to hate it. They're going to hate if there's a cover on. They're going to hate the covers. They're going to hate it. I'm going to get millions of notes. Um, and inevitably you do mm-hmm. because. That's what they're there for. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it's love. I love it when they come back and they reinvest in the show. I think it's so important. I remember at Les Mis, James Powell, when I was there, was one of the associate directors. And he came back on a couple of occasions and watched the show and did a note session. And John Caird came and did a note session. And it makes the actors remember mm-hmm. and not hear it just from my voice. Mm-hmm blah, 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 do this, do that, do the other. When the associates and the directors come back, it ignites something in all of us. Puts a rocket up our backsides as well. (laughs) And a bit of fear. (laughs) Um, But, yeah. How is it taking those notes and then translating them? I know you spoke about it a bit, but taking the notes that you've been given and then having to translate that back to the actors... How's, how does that interface feel in that moment? Yeah, I I deal with it in different ways. Mm. So if, for instance, Richard Eyre, Sir Richard Eyre, the most gorgeous man and wonderful director, has been in to watch the production and has some notes, which he will, of course, I will then either have a notes session to work through his notes or I will and I and I talk about this with the directors as well or I will I will filter it in as if it wasn't 
a Richard Eyre note. If he, like he sure. might not want that to come from him, he might want that to come from me, or you. I can't. And again, it it depends who the note is for, mm. and how invasive the note is. If it's a huge change, or if it's a note that has to be treated very carefully with a specific person, you just have to measure how you give it. Mm. Um, again, that's something that I like doing. I like the psychology of working out how I can get this point across. Yeah. And whether it's something that Richard wants or whether it's a more generic, I can just pass that on and that can be from me. Yeah. Mm in a in a in a dressing room or in a after warm up at a, a note session or something. Yeah. So I'm constantly assessing how I can um give a note. I also kind of stopped calling them notes. I call them thoughts. I just think it's a nicer word. Yes. Yeah, it's, mm. it's less hard. Getting a it? note yeah. is like yes, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> yes. And I just think having a thought or I also like discussing it with the actor. Mm. It's never, it's not a, I'm the resident director, I'm the boss, you're doing this. That does not work. That is the worst. I've tried that and that doesn't work. Mm. And I want to take care of people's egos and of people's, you know, they have to go out there and they have to, they have to, they're the ones that have to tell the story. Right. I can't go out there and do that for them. Um, so I have to, I, I would like to take care of them and make sure that they understand it, that we've discussed it. Yeah. Um, and that if it affects another actor, if that note affects that actor, I'll bring us the three of us or the four of us or the five of us. Right. If it's something in managers at, at in Phantom, you bring the whole all of the managers, the juries, the PN, you bring everybody together and say, we've discussed this. It There there might be some changes this evening, so just be aware. Mm. Because nobody should get a surprise. Yes. Mm. Do you get much resistance? Um, sometimes, yes. Yeah. And how, how much of a two-way street is that resistance? Because obviously there's quite a heavy flow in one direction from directors down but how much bounce back are these actors or even yourself allowed to have i think everything has to i'll always approach it from conversation anyway yeah. so some people will resist some are actors or if it's a note for the music director or you know if it's a note even for wardrobe People will resist. And I always think, well, let's discuss it and let's just try it. And if it doesn't work, what I might be saying might be total and utter crap. Mm. But let's just give it a go. And if it doesn't work, that falls on my shoulders. And if I've tweaked something and the director comes in and says, what is that? I'll always go, look, it's my fault. I hold my hands up. Something wasn't working and we tweaked it. So... There is, yeah, there, to just go back to what you said, there is fallback and there is pushback, certainly. But I'll always go at the end of the day, well, look, I'm not the director, but this isn't working for this reason. And I think I should, I should always have a reason why. Because mm. I've been in that situation, I think, as an actor and even as a creative where somebody has said, well, just because. And that just throws so much just, yeah. caution and trepidation and concern. Yeah. So I think always have... And that's why I always go think back to Sam Lane. She could always back up everything she said. Always had a reason why. This episode is sponsored by Vocality, a specially formulated blend of tea for professional voice users. Each ingredient has been carefully selected to help you soothe and take care of your voice. Vocality is naturally caffeine free, suitable for vegans, and does not contain any artificial flavors or colors. Vocality is the secret to vocal clarity in a cup. I wanted to ask you about auditions because you've been on both sides of that now. Do you have thoughts about the audition process and how we can make that an environment in which 
performers can thrive? Mm. I give every single person that walks into that room the time that they deserve. I've been in so many situations as an actor where I've been sent all this material and I've stressed about learning it and I've, say, been given five sides, two songs and I've gone in and done one of them. And I think that's very, very unfair. I think when a person walks into the room, you give them everything that they want out of that experience. You make sure that you invest in them, which I do. Um, I I hope that when I audition people, they go out of the room and they feel like they've done everything they could do. And I'll always say, you know, are you happy with that? Was that okay? Obviously, auditions, you know, you have to keep to time. Mm. And I've always got the casting director next to me, like, <laughs> telling me to hurry up. Mm. But I think the environment for an actor is terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. It was for me. Mm. I don't think I was very good at it. And I think as I grew, as I got older in the industry as an actor, I got worse at it. Because I wanted to do so well. Um, and I had many auditions that went so badly. And I and I wonder whether that were, wasn't just my fault. You know, I think that I'd auditioned for some lovely people over the years, but then a lot of times where I felt like I couldn't show what I wanted to show because I was rushed out of the room. Mm -hmm. And I'm just very conscious that the actor comes into the room and they do what they can do. So I think it's really important to take care of the artists when they come in the room mm -hmm. to make sure that they have time with the musical director if they need it. If they want to have another go at it, you know, then let them have another go at it. Because it's a horrible environment. Mm -hmm. It can be a horrible, scary environment. Um, so I try to make it not that. And certainly working for CML with those all of those lovely creatives and the brilliant casting directors who are of, of equal, you know, thought. Mm. It's, it generally is a, is a kind place to be. How is it on your side of the table now? How is that experience? You mentioned sort of having to keep to time and get through. How do you hold all these people in your head? Do you know straight away when you see somebody? Yeah, I think you can kind of tell when somebody walks in the room. If you're recasting a production, you know if you're doing a recast of Mary Poppins, for instance. You have an idea of who you're replacing. So you know you're looking for, I don't know, a Mrs. Corrie, you're looking for a first cover Mrs. Corrie, a second cover Mary Poppins, a first cover Mr. Banks, blah, 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 all of these things. So when the person comes in the room, you instantly look at them and go, George Banks, Winifred Banks, Mrs. Corrie, Mrs. Brill. So fit, you're looking physically at them before they've done anything. Mm. Then they open their mouth and they either do a first round of a song that they've chosen and then you're listening to what they're doing yes she looks like a winifred but she does she isn't she doesn't sound like a winifred or she doesn't sound like a mary so that puts a person out of the running straight away and it's not because they're not talented it's just because they don't fit into the mold of what mary is or what george is um so you're you're putting them in little pockets. They're in the Mary world, they're in the Bert world, and then you start to look at them with the material. And it's then when they do the material and they're bringing the words off the page and they're starting to physicalise who that being is, that's when you start to work out, right, yeah, the, they are definitely in the, the Mary mould. If you've met somebody before... If you've met somebody on another production, worked with them, you know, in another role, is it hard to then see them in a new light? It can be. People are pigeonholed. I try not to do that. 
be very difficult. Though. It is really mm. difficult. And I think especially, I, I, I seem to always be going back to Cameron's productions, but they're so character based. If you think of um, Mary Poppins and The Phantom of the Opera, um, they're very, you know, there are not similar, but, you know, you've got, or, or Les Mis, for instance, you've got the Tenardiers, who are the comedy couple. You have the managers, who are the light relief. You have the Mrs. Brill and the Roberts and I, who are the comedy pair. So all of these characters are put into um, little tiny families of their own. Mm. And you audition all of these people and then what we do is we start to put them together and we audition the managers together or we audition the Tenardiers together and see what their dynamic is like. So if you think of a, a Mrs Brill, you also kind of think of a Madame Tenardier mm. and you then think of somebody that comes to mind, an extraordinary human being, Claire Machin. Mm. You know, she is that part. She is that, she falls into that bracket. Um, so people do, like, she's not a Fontaine. You know, she's not a, you know, she's not a Mary. That's her casting bracket. So people do fall into casting brackets. Um, but it is, it is easy to pigeonhole people. Mm. Because you look at somebody in a role and then you think, oh, they can only play that role. So if they've played, I don't know, George Banks, then who else do they play in the Cameron world? Mm. They play a manager in The Phantom of the Opera. I feel like this is a whole episode. Yeah, it's going to... All by itself. It, yeah, Sorry, it's I opened Pandora's box. <laughs> <laughs> so casting casting yeah. is... Yeah. It's really... I, I found that when I started doing this, it, it's mind-boggling mm. and because all of these roles are cast in pairs or trios the cassettes the mariuses and the eponines are all cast together mm. the jean valjean and the javert are cast together winifred and george are cast together you pair them all up or you mm. trio them all up that's really interesting mm. that's a really interesting part of the process like you might lo love a winifred but a different actor just works better with a with yeah. a different George. Right. Mm. So it's so mind boggling. Yeah. I don't know how you find your way from one end of it to the other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Wow. So thank you so much. much. Absolutely fascinating listening to you talk. It's just wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions for you. Oh, okay. The first one is what do you do at the five minute call? Now, I've always got my notebook in my hand mm -hmm. and a pen. I'm never in the actor's dressing room at the five-minute call. That's their time. I try and never go in after the half, unless it's for a biscuit <laughs> <laughs> and a chat. Mm -hmm. But never, if it's important, a note or a thought. A thought. <laughs> but at the five, I'm probably making my way to front of house to go and stand at the back, stand at the sound desk or sit in a seat and watch. Or I'm in the company office doing a schedule. Or I'm running home to walk the dog <laughs> after I've given some thoughts. and But generally, front of house or in a corridor somewhere waiting for it to start. Do you feel a buzz? Yeah. Yeah, being yeah. part of... that's. I think that's why I don't miss being an actor so much because I'm in the environment where the audience is and I'm experiencing what they experience. That's really, really, really special to me. Sitting down and waiting for it to start for the three millionth time <laughs> <laughs> on a Saturday afternoon. Mm. It's it's so amazing. There's very, very nice. fortunate. Yeah. 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 We have a little bit of a tradition oh, okay. on this podcast where we get the guest, the previous guest, to write a question that goes completely sight unseen to everybody until this moment. Oh, wow. And you get to answer that question. Ooh. So, the question from 
Oh yeah, who was our it? Our previous guest. So we're not going to tell you. Oh. Okay. If you weren't doing this job, what would you be doing instead? I'd probably... It would have to be something, I think, related to theatre. If I weren't an actor or a resident director, I think I'd be a designer. Ooh. Yeah. I think I'd be a set designer. Because when I've had the opportunity to direct my own things, I've always got such a strong opinion of how it looks. And I just love... I'm so... I I follow so many set designer Instagrams and I just find it so interesting how they've come up with that process. So I think Mm. I'd be a designer. Yeah. I kind of think I am a designer Mm. in a weird way. Uh, Yeah, I think I'd do that. I love it. Maybe it's yet to come. Yeah. Yeah. That's next. That's next on the (laughs) road. Maybe. (laughs) Mark, thank you so much. Thank you you for having me. This has been really special. It's been lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of The 5 Minute Call. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, like this video, and ring the bell for notifications. Your support really helps us bring you more amazing stories. If you are or have been affected by any of the topics discussed in today's episode, please see the show notes below for some helpful resources.